forged secretly in mortuary archaeology's hottest furnace. It's Archaeodeath. It's me, Professor Howard Williams, I'm Professor of Archaeology, and I am on TikTok sharing educational and entertaining and engaging content about the archaeology and heritage of death and memory. And on this evening's Archaeodeath Live, I am going to be discussing the thorny topic of cultural appropriation. And I am going to reflect on this because it's not an area of my expertise per se, but it is uh, inevitable that I will need to do some academic reading and reflections on the topic, given how prevalent discussions of cultural appropriation are and the different dimensions that cultural appropriation takes, both digitally and in the real world. And so what I want to do is to spend about half an hour, 40 minutes, uh, discussing cultural appropriation from an archaeologist's perspective. And I've seen a lot of discussion of cultural appropriation focusing on the, the, the different aspects of songs, arts, you know, uh, costume, but all of which have material culture and relate to archaeology in one way or another. But I want to sort of go through it. Now, cultural appropriation as a general term is often deriving from discussions of colonialism and minority groups in Western and global cultures. And it is often defined as a majority group adopting cultural elements of a minority group in an exploitative, disrespectful or stereotypical way. Um, and that is a definition from the Encyclopedia Britannica. But as you'd expect, academics and the wider public have very different views upon it. Uh, a famous book on, from 2008, Cultural Appropriation and the Arts, by James O. Young, takes a very broad approach to cultural appropriation and sees any kind of cultural exchange as cultural appropriation. And then, surprise, surprise, is able to come to the conclusion that most cultural appropriation is okay and it does little harm but that's when uh, only when you take such a broad definition uh, and, and different types so um, a young right help is helpful in in explaining that cultural appropriation can be about subject matter the appropriation of a particular kind of subject matter of content of reusable material and themes um, you know in terms of discussions you know, talking about other cultures while not being part of them, um, and object appropriation, which is really what archaeology is in some ways. And it's been said to me, oh, archaeology is only cultural appropriation. So I want to contend with those issues and get back to them. Um, but I also found two very useful articles on cultural appropriation that I think set up an academic framework um, that I want to share with you. First is by Patty Tamara Leonard and Peter Ballant, who are, um, uh, one's Canadian, one's Australian based academics. And in an article in the journal Ethnicities from 2020, um, they have an article called what is the, the, what is the wrong of cultural appropriation? And I want to go through their approach because I find that very useful. And also an article from 2021 from the Journal of Folklore Research by Jason Baird Jackson on uh, an essay called On Cultural Appropriation. Now, neither of these pieces are specifically about archaeology, but I think they're quite useful starting points. And the, the, the other point I'm reacting to is the accusation and a rather um, tempestuous or, should we say, argumentative academic who over the weekend was accusing me of all manner of misunderstandings and um, uh, making the point that all well, cultural appropriation is just sharing of information there's nothing inherently wrong or problematic with cultural appropriation so my, my reaction to that is that actually academics have put a lot of effort into trying to define and debate what is cultural appropriation and these two articles are a useful starting point so um what is let's start with uh, leonard leonard and balance uh 
piece what is the wrong of cultural appropriation. Now, they make the point that there is obviously so much noise, so much drama about this. Everything is about offence and misrepresentation. And they make an argument that, uh, firstly, um, cultural appropriation is uh, a very divisive topic. It, it's global in its parameters and it's a it's a social media drama as well that any accusation of cultural appropriation and counter accusations or denials it rarely ends well it's very difficult to it to be this polemicizing it's divisive um and what they argue is that in the context of multiculturalism we need to be very clear and careful about our terms and our parameters particularly when we're multiculturalism is moving from simply recognizing the minority rights to understanding issues of in, um, social cohesion and integration and, and difference within multicultural societies to broader debates about what is a culture and how do cultures interact and change. And they make the point that there are sort of two strands of reaction to um, discussions of cultural appropriation. The first is a sceptical approach to reject it and say it's, it's just um, policing the natural processes that it's um um it's 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 um that it's a kind of pc gone mad it's political correctness gone mad and it detracts from real issues and that indigenous people and minority groups don't actually care about things being stolen they really care about economic benefits and rights and and and, and that the, these are just distractions um that um going through to um claims that offence um, is, is, a, is, a, is, is about claiming offence is a strategy. It's just a, it's just a, a, a grift. It's just a, 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 a play. Um, and the accusation that um, actually cultural appropriation is a positive thing, that having your stuff taken from you and widely used allows your culture to benefit. And there are certainly cases where you could say that that's true. It can be a, an appreciation. And all appropriation is just appreciation. Um, and then, of course, there's those in more support of, of or sympathetic with accusate, um, uh, identifying cultural appropriation, seeing that there's a moral question here and there's an ethical question here. This is about a history of privilege and power and a cultural appropriation being always an extension of that history of privilege and power that there's something inauthentic about taking things from other cultures without permission and without understanding the context of that work and, and that, that that culture and that in many ways cultural appropriation is theft and there's no, a, a, a there's a sense of morality or immorality and illegality um, that it's taken without permission, it's taken, it's a form of cultural theft. Uh, and those are the sort of, the, the sort of crude, you know, I, I simplify, as, as when I'm trying to simplify uh, an article, and uh, I'm, I'm obviously taking a lot of issues very simply, but they argue that this is, that both sides, their argument, Leonard and Ballant is saying both sides don't get it quite right. Um, there's always going to be ex cultural exchange, um, but all cultural exchange is not appropriation right that appropriation doesn't mean just sharing and we shouldn't say for example that you know you say italians may decry drinking cappuccino cappuccino after lunch or the mere existence of new york style or chicago style pizza but that doesn't make it a cultural appropriation right it, it needs to be more than just a, 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 a shared cuisine or music it's more than just cultural exchange there's something about cultural appropriation that is more than that so we should neither deny it or dismiss it nor you know say any kind of cultural sharing is cultural appropriation it's not it's not constructive to you know conflate cultural exchange and cultural appropriation and they make two they identify two phenomena um it's not I'm not 100% satisfied that they clarified this properly. They said there are two things that are often called cultural appropriation that are not cultural appropriation, but they are problematic and they can cause offence. And the first one is cultural offence. And they say that cultural offence, um, that, that, um, 
Acts of cultural appropriation often generate cultural offence, but cultural offence is something is not cultural appropriation, and that cultural offence can be can be attained, can be um, um, inflicted without cultural appropriation. So mocking another culture, you know, racist jokes. These don't involve stealing a piece of culture, but they can still be offensive. So cultural offence is something in itself that we need to consider. And they argue, and I don't necessarily agree with this because my other article takes a different view, that a lot of the representations of um, indigenous culture in popular US society, such as the Washington Redskins and all this kind of thing, is actually cultural offence and not cultural appropriation. It's deriding and stereotyping those cultures. And that overlaps with another theme that they identify as not cultural appropriation, which is cultural misrepresentation, which can be about stereotyping, humiliating, insulting, portrayals, um, mimicking accents. It's not that you're trying to necessarily be of that culture by doing a bad wearing a Mexican sombrero but you're misrepresenting that Mexican tradition in a particular way so I, I'm not so sure but they are trying to make the point that there's other forms of derogatory treatment of minority groups that isn't appropriation appropriation is something separate or different or more advanced or, or more pronounced than simply mocking deriding stereotyping and offending um, and I think that's a really interesting point for conversation. I, that I don't fully convince they, they bracket and differentiate them fully, but I think it's an important point to say that cultural appropriation isn't just any kind of cultural exchange and cultural appropriation isn't simply causing an offence or misrepresentation. And I deal on TikTok with a lot of misrepresentation of the past but they're saying cultural appropriation is something, something else. So they try to then go forward and identify what are the parameters of cultural appropriation. They talk about James O. Young and they say that James O. Young does a broad survey of different kinds of cultural appropriation, subject appropriation, object appropriation, content appropriation. And their focus is, is really on subject commemoration. So they say, so for example, the depiction of both African-Americans and Native Americans in 20th century Hollywood films, um, you know, is could be seen. These are seen here as stemming from wrongs of stereotyping and caricaturing. But these are wrongs are, are more about misrepresentation and offensiveness rather than appropriation. And they say that Young's parameters are too broad. We need to think of much more specifically what is a specific appropriation rather than simply misrepresentation and uh, offence. Um, and they say there's a number of specific dimensions that make something cultural appropriation. They say there's the condition of taking, there's the value of the condition, the thing being taken has a value. Um, um, there's was it done deliberately or with culpable ignorance? In other words, could you expect the person to know they were taking something? Or could it be, oh, I just came to South Africa and I was making a record and I just happened to hear a few tunes in the bar in the, in the you know, and, and I thought, hey, I could do a song like that and I could talk about diamonds on the soles of my shoes and that would be cool. And I never, I didn't realise that I just, it just osmosis, man. It just came, or whatever it may be, you know, <laughs> is, is there a not, can you expect that person did it on purpose? And the fourth point, so it's take it, the, how it's taken, the value of the condition, the thing being taken, the knowledge and culpability involved, and is this already a contested area? You know, is there already a tradition of contestation, of dispute, of claiming this as something that's culturally protected and respected? And so they, they, they argue that the taking condition is, is, is not in the most literally exclusive sense. It, it, they say it's a it's, um, for example, when Beyonce wore a, a henna and a sari in a 2018 music video and shot in Mumbai. It's self-portraying Indian festivals and cultural symbols. The practices and symbols she was accused of appropriating were not originally hers, nor certainly nor exhausted by her actions, even if they may have felt diminished by her accusers. Um, the taking is therefore not lit, is, is not in its most literally exclusively sense uh, as is not a case of co object appropriation, but simply that the idea, style or practice did not originate with the appropriator. So you've got to identify, is this taken from someone else? And that's the, really the straightforward thing. And the first thing is, you know, is this nicked? In the case of Beyonce's video, she went to Mumbai, filmed the video, all the cultural symbols, all the festivals, and went, yeah, this is now part of my 
my griff. This is part of my performance. So that would be pretty straightforward as a taking condition of, of cultural appropriation, right? Then they say that there's a value condition, and this this is, you know, is something is there something taken of value? Like, you know, did she just go to Mumbai and she's standing on a street corner in Mumbai doing a dance? In which case the dance isn't taken, the setting is, is Mumbai, but th there's nothing, it's still Beyonce, it's still her music, what's being nicked? No, it's the full dressing up, it's the, da you know, it's the mimicking dancing, you know, it's the full routine. I can't even remember this music video, I'm just saying, using their example. So, you know, my example, the point is, there's the value condition, so... They, they say there's a number of different dimensions to this this value. You know, is it something that is um, let me get this point. Is it is it something central to that culture? Is it something recognisable as part of that culture widely? Um, is it widely valued within that culture as, as a part of that culture? Um, does it and this is a really interesting point. Is it a part of that culture where? the voices of victims um, can be identified and listened to. So if it's not, a, if it's like taking from a particular cultural group, it only affects wheelchair bound men in their fifties. It doesn't make it okay that they're just a tiny part of that culture. It's if they, if they are being targeted and they are victims of a particular piece of cultural appropriation, then those voices should be thought, you know, and, 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 is there finally is there a historical is this historical you know like is it a long out of date practice from the 1930s or the 1840s or is it something people still do and in their argument if it's up to date and still being used then it's offensive it's cultural appropriation but if it's historical it's not now as a historian as an archaeologist i don't know I, i'm not so sure about that one i think that something that can be centuries old and not in use can still be cultural appropriation if taken out of its context, cultural context and it still has meaning within that context but anyway that's their criteria right but they then go on and this is the next point is that they has to be uh conditions of contestation and 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 of knowledge that you're doing something wrong so if it's a republican governor governor in a midwestern state who decides to wear a headdress and you know their constituents are native american they should know Right. I'm not saying it's OK if it's a, 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 t a TikToker in Yorkshire doing it, but it's a different ball game from a politician in a state literally living within miles or metres of people of that of that culture. You know, there should be there should be a, you know, a knowledge that they're doing on purpose. And, and, and sometimes we see, particularly in the States, politicians and others will deliberately perform cultural appropriation, not simply to show not and show knowledge of it as a grandstanding, as a provocation, as a mocking. So the act of doing it, and there's a case in my, the other paper I looked at where uh, there was a Republican government, governor in Oklahoma actually called the social media post something like appropriate culture or something, they're playing on the idea of cultural appropriation, but, um, but you know, deliberately mocking, defying the audience to challenge it. Um, you know, defying the audience, appropriate culturation, they called it. You know, in other words, they're saying, I know what I'm doing, screw you i'm doing it anyway and what are you going to do about it liberals you know whatever it may be <laughs> you know what are you going to do you know um <laughs> sorry um, but you know and so there's a knowledge and culpable ignorance you know is there a, is this can we make a reasoned argument this was done on purpose or do they have a get out clause of oh i really didn't know i just thought that was a dance or i thought that was a piece of music it just happens to sound like okay and here's the point that I think they structure the argument really well is they say the amplifiers, right? So most of that cultural appropriation is, let's say it's knowledgeable. It takes a central, recognisable, valued piece of a past of, an, of a, a living culture that, uh, uh, no, that, that we can identify victims, that it's contemporary. You know, it fits all those criteria. They still argue that most of that cultural appropriation is not harmful. Or it's not massively harmful. The most of that all those cultural appropriations needn't do deep harm to a culture until you add the amplifiers. And their point is that the amplifiers are the unequal power relationships. You know, that this is being done in a context of deliberate to denigrate or to appropriate a part of a culture that's had a history 
of power differential, right? That's where it really becomes clear. Um, and when there's a profit, when it's commercialised and it's part of a profit motive, that there's a huge amount of, you know, it may be the person in question may be of a very multicultural part of a multicultural city, but the way they wear their jeans is now being commercialised and sold around the world because of a small group of black, black women in a particular suburb of New York City wore their jeans, adapted their jeans in a particular way, and that is stolen. It's not necessarily that that is uniquely theirs originally. It's not something that's deep time. It's not part of an ancient tradition of wearing jeans, but it's culturally appropriate. It's deliberately taken and millions and millions are made off it. Then, then that is the amplifier to make it a serious, significant issue. Now, Again, I want to qualify for those that are latecomers. I'm not giving you my thesis. I'm talking from a, an article by Leonard and Ballant from 2019 in the journal Ethnicities. And I'm just trying to explain their stance on cultural appropriation. They're not trying to excuse it, but they're trying to say there's different kinds of cultural appropriation and we need to identify it's not the same as just any kind of cultural exchange. It's not just kind, it's not the same as cultural misrepresentation and cultural offence. It's about a particular taking of a central, recognisable, valued um, uh, um, element of a culture from identifiable victims um, and is a contemporary use where there's a huge power imbalance or significant power imbalance for profit. <laughs> so that's their argument that makes something cultural appropriation. And that's a bit of a long-winded definition. It's not something that easily spins off the mind, which is why I'm doing this in a TikTok Live rather than uh, doing it elsewhere. But I think that's a really helpful point. And they finished the article by saying um, that um, many claimed appropriations of modes of dress, of hairstyle, denying the right of choices, um, could be recognised as problematic, uh, will be recognised as problematic, and that many of these cases, individual cases, are trivial, you know, but it's the volume and the differential and the amplifier effect that makes them so powerful. So it's not just that one, one white person has cornrows, that's not causing anyone any real harm, but it's the, the global, you know, systematic, system, well, it's what we talk about all the time, isn't it? Systemic appropriation and the differential that makes things um, cultural appropriation. That, that's their take on it. So in response to the academic who was saying cultural appropriation has only recently been misunderstood as bad and cultural appropriation is any kind of cultural exchange, academics like these are saying no, that's not what the way we're seeing cultural appropriation. Cultural appropriation is a specific phenomenon of the modern world which we can identify with set criteria. Now, there may be debates over how we apply that and quantify that, but there's a broad, that's their stance, okay? So you can go and read that, and I'll just repeat the details of it if you're interested. The article is downloadable for free. What is the wrong of cultural appropriation? By Patty Leonard and Peter Ballant, and it's in the journal Ethnicities for 2020, volume 20, part two, pages 331 to 352. And obviously I haven't represented everything they say. But I have problems and limitations with it, but I'll come back to that in a little while, because I want to now go on and talk about my second article. And this article is written by an American folklorist at uh, University of Indiana Bloomington, or Bloomington, Indiana, or which way round you call it. And he's coming from a folklore and ethnomusicology perspective. Um, and... Jackson Bar Baird, Jack, um, Jason Baird Jackson's article is called On Cultural Appropriation and he does something different. He doesn't try to, where he shares with Leonard and Ballant is trying to making clear that cultural appropriation isn't everything, right? So just going along and being influenced by a piece of music or liking the look of a skirt is not cultural appropriation. You know, eating a pizza is not cultural appropriation. Going to a Mexican restaurant and being posed with a waiter or whatever is not cultural appropriation. You know, but there, but the cultural appropriation needs to be sat within a broad range of different kinds of cultural exchange. And he says, there's a, he, he goes to a very broad general model and he says, we need to understand various different modes of cultural exchange. And the easiest thing to do is to show you the, the crude little diagram he has in the article. And then you can, uh, you can follow along what I'm what I'm talking about with that. So let me just 
try and uh, flip around the camera in my office here and you can see his oh there it is down there uh, the angle is a bit tight actually let me do this from my lap so you can see it a bit better it may be a bit jo jogging then but if you can if you can see that so uh, one second just give me a second I'll get it all sorted right so there we are so basically saying in crude terms there are different kinds of cultural exchange there's diffusion which is the transmission over in space of different kinds of information and practice and customs this can happen from ancient societies through to modern capitalist global systems and people are either ignorant or un not bothered about that transmission it just happens shit happens people change what they do they change their ideas diffusion this is a broad concept in cultural studies and archaeology too then we have and that's the top you know the, the shapes don't matter he's showing the green on the left the, the yellow on the right there's an equal exchange both ways different ideas flow i don't think it's ever quite so neutral as that but let's just go with the flow for this <laughs> for this simple crude uh distinction then he talks about acculturation which often happens in a power differential it's unequal and there's social dynamics of face-to-face long-term contact where two groups change both on both sides because of exchange but there's a power differential so the the green shaped society here is is giving more to the other society is acculturating another society that may be in a colonial context it may be in a um some kind of migration context it, you know but there's a power differential in terms of the scale of one population over the other or the the the, the positions and uh, uh power of that society and then there's a third thing he calls assimilation which is where there's an intentional domination of one group by another you know this is what we call some of the more extreme colonial contexts where there's you know a, a military takeover there's settlements there's domination of the other group and that would be called assimilation you know like the borg you know that, i mean not that extreme but you know that that kind of assimilation of indigenous peoples native peoples to a broader context and then he fits um you know uh cultural appropriation into this where one society is going to mi minority groups and taking back that that information and taking it without permission for their use and so he says we need to understand the severity and character of cultural appropriation in relative and relational context and we've also got to recognize that different groups have different agencies that some of these minority groups may have a lot of agency in exploiting and manipulating and using this cultural appropriation to their advantage in other cases it's simply exploitation and theft so it will vary and it will vary in terms of our responsibilities to respond to it now there's a lot more he says in the article but i thought that would be a good point to share with you that cultural appropriation is again not considered by scholars to be all kinds of cultural exchange and when I see people online constantly telling me, oh, you know, cultural appropriation is just natural. Everyone does it. Every time I blow my nose, I'm culturally appropriating. You you woke PC libtards. You're always talking about cultural. No, we're talking about a very specific aspect of cultural exchange between communities. And yes, that also applies to multicultural societies, because while cultures can be complex and varied and interleaving and overlapping and changing through time, Cultural appropriation still serves to define um, that power differential, unequal, deliberate, systematic taking of other people's culture and ideas. <clears throat> so I'll pause there for a second. I want to welcome you all if you're late, but I've just been going through some academic literature on cultural appropriation to help us understand different ways of thinking about it from an academic point of view this isn't my work i'm just sharing a couple of things i've read that are recent articles on this um i think appreciation um is a kind of just as appropriation needs to be more tightly tightly defined appreciation is a more embedded recognizing the origins context and significance but it can still be a form of appropriation so i'm not sure it you know again we have to think about responsibility in context of what is appreciation but i would say appreciation could be within a context of assimilation acculturation or diffusion um but is not is something other than the deliberate taking with purpose 
and with knowledge that you're taking something central to another culture. You're knowledgeable, but you're doing it with some kind of contextual respect and understanding and permission. So that's what I was now from an archaeologist perspective. Um, I want to make a few points. Now, all of these approaches are very much to do with the arts and to do with culture and costume. They're very little to do with archaeology. Now, the thing is that an archaeologist's approach to material culture would say that in many ways we would question what is a culture and there's a very blurred conception of what a culture is. Cultures are always changing. They never have clear defined boundaries. So we do need to be very careful and qualified about what we mean by a culture. Um, but we, the other point I would say that both of those studies don't really emphasise is that cultural appropriation is often not simply taking place in the context of a historical process, but in very specific ideologies of what is deemed appropriate to take by the dominant group. And I don't think any of them nail it. It's not just about the power differential. It's about the ideology of appropriation, of which Western colonialism is a paramount example. It's not that you can, it's that you feel you should. <laughs> it's and, and, and that this colonialism, which includes the appropriation of objects, cultural sites, is a deliberate systematic strategy of an ideological programme. So whether that's renaming settlements in, the, in, in, in Palestine, and and replacing the narratives of them, removing objects from Ukrainian museums to turn, return to return them to Mother Russia when they were never there in the first place. Whatever you see, it can be a part of military conquest. It can be part of colonial processes, but it's part of an ideology of supremacy that can be defined in racial terms, nationalistic terms, imperial terms. But it is a part of a historical ideological process. And I was shocked to see that neither of those studies by different academics from other disciplines really framed ideolo ideology as an integral part of cultural appropriation. It may not be overtly ideological, but I think often it is. But it, it can be to do with that entitlement, that encouragement to perform cultural appropriation um, as or cultural dominance. The other thing I was shocked by is how little these studies attended, including James O. Young's book, to the global pillaging of indigenous peoples, sites and monuments um, from the 18th, 19th century, of which archaeology is basically originates. You know, they don't seem to have much understanding of the object appropriation as cultural appropriation and the 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 broader implications of that that broader history so um, i just wanted to add those points of qualification now in terms of archaeology um i did want to say a few points about how archaeology fits in here i would say that it could be said that historically archaeology is cultural appropriation it is uh, the very discipline of archaeology is a not just simply a, an object of appropriation, but it is a cultural content and subject appropriation by the removing, the study, the extraction of information through, and ethnography and anthropology too, the extraction of information from other cultures to repurpose it within frameworks and narratives that fit within a nation state. So you could say that archaeology is a form of cultural appropriation that can be linked to genocide, missionizing and other processes of, of the colonial imperial projects and national nation building, because it can be about internal colonization within nation states. So archaeology could be seen as, as and it's not outrageous, it's, it's a bit flattening and reductive and, and out of date, because archaeology isn't that anymore, I would contend. But you could say archaeology as a discipline is part of that colonial project and is therefore perhaps a part of cultural appropriation. That's something. So. Then you could also say that even when archaeology has stopped being a, a form of cultural appropriation itself, archaeology still operates to legitimise and enable cultural appropriation, directly and indirectly. So, for example, heritage tourism, um, the strategies by which we present and value objects in museums, even if legally acquired and fully legitimately on display with permissions and uh, rights, can still be a way of packaging, commodifying, uh, re re retelling the stories of 
past and present. And that's the other point about archaeology is cultural appropriation isn't simply about is a phenomenon of the present is to describe the present, but it's not just about present day stuff. It can be Paleolithic objects. It can be ancient Maya sculpture that when taken and repurposed into Western museums and, and, and stores and, and libraries as information, this is all of perhaps a form of cultural appropriation that needs further conversation and discussion. And maybe when archaeology is, uh, archaeology is used to legitimize a, a trade in antiquities, the, the values, the acquisition of, of, of metalwork from the Greek and Roman world, that is, in a sense, enabling and legitimizing cultural appropriation. So tourism, collecting practices. But I would also say as a flip side, there's a host of ways now in the early 21st century that archaeology serves as a way of disrupting and resisting cultural appropriation, not only by challenging these histories of misuse and colonization. Um, I mean, honestly, in my lifetime, I haven't called archaeology cultural appropriation at all, because when I'm dealing with cultural objects and human remains, it's always framed as the repatriation and reburial debate. In other words, the onus is on how do we restore? How do we reconcile? How do we address this history of looting, this history of appropriation? So we're already in the next stage. of, And so I've never really called it cultural appropriation because the whole onus, the whole setting is on how do we restore this? How do we address this? So by pursuing reburial and repatriation, we are doing the work of decolonizing and pushing back against historic cultural appropriation. But there's other ways we can do it too. Critiquing and challenging colonial and appropriative heritage tourism practices and interpretations of heritage sites could also be seen as resistance to um, cultural appropriation. Illic um, challenging the illicit trade in antiquities and the licit, the legal trade in antiquities, challenging metal detecting without permission and without responsible reporting. These could also be seen as ways in which archaeology is pushing back at ways in which cultural appropriation takes place in our world. Object appropriation, but also content and subject appropriation too. And I would say, and this is one of the ways I've been pushing back against cultural appropriation, is delegitimizing those that would use pseudo archaeology to claim it's OK. So people who claim, oh, there was a Viking tradition of locked hair. Oh, there was a Viking tradition of face paint and face tattooing. It's OK for me to do this. And what they're doing is they're trying to find the seeking out legitimacy to justify taking things off another culture, in this case, global indigenous communities, but particularly North American. So they're using the Vikings as their cover, as their shield. And archaeology, by sharing reliable information, we're not, we're not only combating the illicit trade in antiquities and challenging looting practices, we're also challenging, which is a form of cultural appropriation of protected sites, but we're also challenging the narratives that would allow it to continue, the delegitimizing those that would try to legitimize their practice. By education and engagement more broadly, we are informing people of cultural sensitivities of the variability of the human species over time and space. This helps people to gain, as anthropologists do, gain a respect for different cultures so that cultural appropriation is all the more difficult to do without ignorance as an excuse. And I suppose one of the key things we need to do is to think of the agency of minority groups affected. Think of the agency of the indigenous groups that to are they are they really upset? Don't try and speak over them or for them. Are they really offended by this or not? You know, there'll be many cases where there's a massive social media outrage and it's just one dude who said, I don't like this. They're taking my culture. And it's really it's, it's no one else cares. You know, so we've got to be careful that we're not trying to speak over or speak for indigenous and minority groups, but we are actually listening to their voices and objections on these issues. So in this case, me talking about this is part of the problem, but rather than part of the solution. But, you know, I'm just trying to sort of outline my my thoughts as I haven't really addressed this before directly. Um, and I think one of the criticisms I'd have of all of these uh 
discussions I've seen is they see digital arena as simply part of the problem. Oh, outrage on Twitter, outrage on Facebook. Whereas actually digital archaeologists doing public engagement education like this is surely part of the problem. And the same for historians and anthropologists and other disciplines too. We're surely part of the problem by explaining the cultures that don't have a voice or don't have recognition in the broader popular culture and explaining their practices, ethnology, anthropology, linguistics. We all are part of that public digital education. So I suppose while there are traditional, archaeology has traditionally been cultural appropriation and archaeology is continue to legitimize and enable cultural appropriation there are many ways that archaeology can be a tool of resistance challenging um the attempts to create false narratives about the past challenging the cultural appropriation straight on challenging the illicit trade and antiquities challenging museum practices and i forgot to mention one challenging the narrative which this other academic was doing at the weekend, that cultural appropriation is natural and everyone has always done it. And it's only being a problem now that a few minority groups are kind of gatekeep their, their spaces. No, cultures have always changed and flowed and, and exchanged. And there's always been power differentials. But we're talking about a very specific phenomenon in a globalised capitalist world. And that's not the same as saying, well, look, the Romans nicked lots of Greek statues or some of these Roman poems that are very similar to some. From, you know. So it's a very different dynamic. So I think the, the, the claims to naturalise a modern 21st century phenomenon as something that's always happened. Everyone's taken ideas. Yes. Cultural exchange has always happened. Cultural transmission has always happened. As, um, acculturation, assimilation have always happened. But cultural appropriation, while we can find an analogues in the past of, of extreme power differentials and systematic um, you know, a takings of ideas and practices from other cultures, you know, as a systematic phenomenon on a global capitalist system scale, this is something about our world, right? This is not something that we can just justify as it's always happened. And so I suppose that's where I've got to with my thinking. And I hope that was of interest to you. Take care, everyone. Thank you very much. And thank you for all the way from Australia, um, Scotland, all the wild and distant places, Canada. Thank you all from across the globe. And I'll be back next Wednesday. Take care. Bye now. For relaxing times, make it Archeodeath time.